record. Okay, so we are, we are recording now. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Thomas Bustamante and I just coordinate these seminars which are held by the Brazilian network of law and uh, uh, of political philosophy and constitutional law, but these are seminar series in law, in law and philosophy held uh, apart from the association by the Federal University of Minas Gerais, where I, where I come from, the Federal University of Pará, the, the Federal University of Paraná, and, and the University of Sao Paulo. They, are, they provide the support with their networks. Uh, today we have uh, uh, Professor Veronica Rodriguez Blanco from the University of Surrey in the UK. She will give us a talk uh, with um, a very interesting uh, paper. Uh, I just, I'm making sure that I got the right title. Uh, Veronica, please <laughs> give us the title of your talk. Yes, yes. so the title is The Backward Looking Parcel of Responsibility and Negligence, Some Preliminary Thoughts for Understanding yeah. Inadvertent Actions. Yeah, <laughs> Very long. Sorry about that. Puzzle of responsibility and negligence, some preliminary thoughts on understanding unadvertent actions. So thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's a great honor. Uh, Veronica is going to speak for us for about um, 30 minutes and then I will do the comments on her work. A very, I promise to be very short so we can get into the debates as soon as possible. Welcome Veronica. It's wonderful to have you here. Finally, you know, be able to, to despite this uh, this pandemic, uh, interact with you and, and listen to your very fine work. Thanks again. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Thomas, for this wonderful invitation and for the initiative of this seminar series. It's very exciting to be able to be listened and to be questioned from different parts of the world. Um, that, that this project is a book I'm writing on negligence, and I see the philosophical reflection of a doctrinal work as in continuity, not separated from doctrinal work. And I will try to here reflect a little bit on how, what is the correct methodology to think about inadvertent actions philosophically and also in the context of, of, in the context of ethics and the law. So this is really the first chapter of the monograph and I'm really interested to hear what people think about it. So obviously improve my, my, my book and my thoughts on this. So in inadvertent actions in relation to legal and moral philosophy have been represented as puzzling on many occasions. In this paper, I aim to show that they are puzzling for different reasons than those usually proposed. Before I do this, it is important that I clarify some assumptions and presuppositions. First, the paper presupposes that intentional action constitutes the paradigm of action. And secondly, it presupposes that intention and intentional actions run parallel to practical reason, and that the first person perspective is the primary perspective to explain intentional action. Now, inadvertent actions seem to be an important challenge to this conception, and the study aims to pave the way for thinking about negligence in the context of the first person perspective. The aim is modest in the sense that it neither offers an account of negligence in the paper, nor a criticism of the view that have been advanced in the literature, but identifies a puzzle that arises in the context of actions from the first person perspective and gestures to a possible methodology for thinking about negligent actions. I see these as a necessary and preliminary task before engaging with the nature of negligent acts and responsibility for negligence. So we can think about inadvertent actions through the paradigmatic example of actions, intentional actions. This entails unpacking actions, as I said, from the deliberative point of view. So now this way of explaining action is mainly what I call forward looking. This means that it focuses on what we bring about with our bodily movements from the point of view of the person who engaged with the action. Now this perspective concentrates on the ideas of movement, change and transformation. By contrast, in our practices of responsibility, when we attribute responsibility for an action, we focus on the past. Our assessment is backward looking and the action is conceived as an event. 
So there is no movement or transformation. Something just happened and the change and transformation in the world has already been affected at the point of the attribution of responsibility. The puzzle of negligence that I will focus on can initially be formulated in a very intuitive way in the following terms. So if in the eventuation of inadvertent action is through the lens of the deliberative of first person perspective and its respective description, which is forward looking and furthermore, if it concerns changes and movement and the grounding logos of reasons, then it is passing how we can grasp the action as an event and something that has already happened in the past. Events are not progressive and do not involve future changes and movements. Philosophically speaking, we need something that seems conceptually impossible. We need a sound backward looking perspective for the purpose of legal and moral responsibility negligence, which at the same time grasps the forward looking perspective. This seems conceptually impossible because it entails a concept that grasps both the changes and movements of inadvertent intentional actions as seen from the deliberative stance and the inadvertent intentional actions as events occurred in the past. Now, the literature of negligence attempts to identify the key features that characterize negligence, but analy analyze, analyzes the analysis tend to be too quick on the sound conception of action as preliminary to determine the constitutive features of negligence. Nearly all authors have assumed that there is a symmetry between the observer or third person perspective and the perspective of deliberation, the liberator or first person perspective. So the tendency is to collapse A, the first person of the liberated perspective into the third or observer's perspective and B, the forward-looking perspective, into the backward-looking perspective. This solution is proposed for intentional action and derivatively, it is thought, could work for inadvertent actions. In other words, as performance of intentional action what ha that happen and brought about, about a result, object, or a state of affairs in the world, we give a report on what happened from the third person or observer perspective. In the case of negligent actions, legal theories and philosophers aim to identify the action from the third person perspective and determine what happened to the agent when she acted inadvertently. For example, legal theorists and philosophers have engaged in trying to determine the absent key element or condition that will enable us to say that the performer of the action acted negligently. So some of some examples of the question posed are, did the agent fail to form the belief that there was a risk in her action? Did she fail to know that there was a risk? Was there a process, which is the result of an interplay of pre-conscious and conscious states that will explain the required control for responsibility negligence? Can we identify a point in the past where the agent chose to have a defective character that led her to the negligent action? Other authors have concentrated on conscious and exercise capacities, characters are factors in, but these accounts neither sufficiently explain nor satisfactorily theorize on the kinds of actions that are presupposed. The following example might illustrate illustrate this symmetrical thesis. Let us suppose that I make a cup of tea whilst an observer watches my bodily movements, for example, boiling the water, putting a tea bag in a tea bag, sorry, in a cup, and a few minutes later, putting the prepared cup of tea on my kitchen table. The observer will attribute to me the mental state of believing that if I boil the water and pour it into a cup with a tea bag, I can make a cup of tea and will also attribute to me the desire to make a cup of tea. Accounting, according to this view, if I ask myself whether I acted intentional, I will also explain the action in similar terms. I will say that I was in the mental state of believing that I will produce a cup of tea and that I had the desire to make a cup of tea. This view assumes that there is a symmetry between the deliberative stance and the observer stance, the third person perspective. Most importantly, within this composition, there will be another symmetrical conflation, and this time between the backward perspective and the forward looking perspective. This means that when I was acting, I was acting because I was in the mental state of believing I will produce a cup of tea in the mental state of desire to make a cup of tea. 
when I look back at the result of my action, I will also explain my action in terms of my mental state, desires, and beliefs. When we think about our practices of responsibility, theories tend to engage in a similar conflation. For example, you make a cup of tea at work, but spill your hot tea over and consequently burn your work colleague who you hate for spreading rumors about you. You make a cup of tea and when you approach your colleague, you pour the hot tea on her hands, but you pretend that it is an accident. The observer could achieve responsibility stating that you had the intention to burn your colleague as you had the mental state of believing that with your actions, you could burn your, her and also the desire to burn her because she had spread rumors about you. The result of the action is a burned skin. We can now attribute a causal link between the mental state, namely a belief in the ability to, and the desire to burn a colleague who is considered an enemy and the result from the action, which is the injury. However, from the deliberative perspective, you only think about how she has spread malicious rumors about you, how your reputation has been damaged and how you are constitutes a true act of secret revenge. You make a very hot cup of tea and think how to walk by and pretend that spilling it is a pure accident. Your focus is on what actions are required to pretend that the hot cup of tea slipped from your hands resulting in injury. The structure of the agent's practical reasoning is present and gives a different intelligibility to the act. The focus is on the becoming or unfolding of the action, namely the process of exacting revenge and pretending as key to the appearance of an accident. In the former description, we assume there is a fact of the matter and cause a link between the mental state and the state of affairs in the world that needs to be disentangled and which determines whether the person is responsible. In the latter description, we focus on the process of practical reasoning and the becoming of the action. At first glance, there does not appear to be any substantive distinction explaining the action. We can assume the conflation with no laws, as it seems that the observer perspective captures the first person perspective. However, problems arise when we think about inadvertent actions. Let us imagine the following example, driving above the speed limit. You are driving at slightly over the speed limit in a school zone. Namely, the speed limit is 20 miles per hour and you are driving at 25 miles per hour at the same time as listening to loud music. A child crosses the street, you fail to notice him and consequently run over, causing him to be injured. In explanatory terms, the observer will say that you were in the mental state of being distracted and therefore you drove at a high speed and this caused the injury of the child. The but for or counterfactual test of causation will explain that your mental state of distraction caused the injury of the child. The observer could also say there was a foreseeable risk that you ought to have grass, but did not. How would we explain this in terms of mental state in the observer's point of view? We could say that you were responsible because you were not in the mental state of believing in the foreseeable risk, and you should have been. You ought to have known or been aware that it was a school zone and consequently that there was a reduced speed limit and that it was likely children would be around. On the other hand, from the first person perspective, you were engaged in the action of enjoying your favorite radio station, which just happened to be playing your most beloved piece of music. You were carried away by the beauty of the music and pressed the pedal without realizing that what, what was happening. We could add that the reasons for your actions, namely pressing the pedal where your, where your emotions and thoughts about pleasure and beauty, namely imaginary thoughts, arose by the beauty of the music, etc. The observer or third person perspective in the case of inadvertent actions does not explain the action, but merely establishes the mental state that ought to have in order to avoid responsibility. This being so, how does the absence of this mental state, namely the failure to be in the mental state of foreseeing, forming the belief of having the true and justified belief, provide an intrinsic and intelligible connection to the outcome of the action. In cases of inadvertent actions, the symmetry between the third and first person perspectives seems to break down. In other words, the way the agent sees her own action while acting and the way she looks back and sees the action as an outcome or result are different. 
this difference is not grasped by the symmetrical view. Notice the contrast with our ordinary language in which this difference is usually well grasped and clearly conveyed by our daily expressions. In the context of our previous example, the speeding driver will say, at the moment of the accident, I did not mean to hurt a child. I was just listening to my favorite music. By contrast, in an imaginary world where our ordinary language reflects the symmetrical view, the speeding driver will instead say, at the moment of the accident, I was listening to my favorite music. And at the same time, unfortunately, there was an absence of the appropriate mental state that would have enabled me to prevent the accident. In the context of our current linguistic practices, how should we understand this? Did the driver know at the point of action that she lacked the requirement to stay? The latter statement makes sense only after the accident, but it is not part of the structure of practical reasoning of the agent when she's performing the action. It seems to us unintelligible that while she is performing the action, she knows that the, that the appropriate mental state is absent. How can she be aware of the absence of certain mental state and how this absence explains the action? Not surprisingly, we need to resort to theoretical mechanisms, for example, pre-conscious, conscious states, which fail to explain how the agent and not an internal mechanism generated the action. If the symmetrical view is the correct account of action and we need to rely on it to explain responsibility negligence, it seems that the skeptical positions have their upper hand in the discussion. I will advance a view that we can think about backward looking in avertant actions in our practices of responsibility if we change the methodological focus of our inquiry. We will, when we scrutinize inadvertent backward looking actions, we do not look at facts like mental states and facts in the world as the consequence of our actions, as this way of thinking obscure the phenomenology of agency and responsibility. By contrast, I will use an important analogy between seeing an aspect and seeing an inadvertent act. And will argue that both depend on our trained capacities and dispositions and the way they are immersed in our daily lives. In paragraph two of the paper, I explain the phenomenon of seeing an aspect as advanced by Ludwig Wittgenstein in philosophical investigations. In paragraph three, I show the analogies between seeing an aspect and seeing an inadvertent action and focus on explaining how seeing an inadvertent act is immersed in our daily activities and practices of attributing responsibility and how we can create a backward looking perspective that grasps the first person perspective or deliberate stance. Finally, I will explain the implications of this new methodology for thinking about legal and moral responsibility negligence. I wonder, Thomas, if you mind to share the image that I've just sent you. So seeing an aspect, Wittgenstein introduces the idea of seeing an aspect in the second part of philosophical investigations with a puzzle of how we see two figures how we see two figures from the same drawing, where the physical properties of the picture remain intact, namely the lines, colors, shape, and organization. As you can see, you have the drawing, the drawing in front of you. When we look initially at the drawing, we see a duck. We even think about ducks in a pond and the feathers and different colors of ducks. When we look again and more closely, we see a rabbit and then thoughts of rabbits and rabbit activities might come to our minds. For example, rabbits jumping in a meadow, rabbits eating carrots. It seems that we relate to the two pictures not in terms of the physical reality of the physical characteristic in the drawing have not changed. Namely, the lines of the drawing are the same. Neither do we relate to the pictures in terms of their organization because the organization has not changed. What is it that has changed and that enables us to see a rabbit at some specific time and then all of a sudden a duck? What changes is our perspective, in other words, how we relate to the lines in the drawing. This is what Wittgenstein calls aspect dawning. The perspective is not completely chosen by you as it is imposed on you. The aspect of the picture is imposed on us. We cannot help but see a rabbit and then all of a sudden change happens and we now see a duck. 
the description is reached spontaneously and we immediately discard all the possibilities. For example, it is not a donkey, it is not a smiley face, etc. We also think about the figure as we have learned to respond to what it represents and how it relates to other objects. For example, rabbits and meadows. We have learned that rabbits jump in meadows and the dark swimming lakes, and we are reason responsive through our reason concepts to these objects in the world. In other words, we identify the figure by the thing that it represents. The visual experience is not only physical, but thought seems to be part of the visual experience. So it is not the case that I only see my eyes, but I also somehow see with my thought. But thoughts are not merely mental states and should not be seen as mysterious entities. They are learned in our interactions with the world and we learn to respond to the world with reasons and emotions. The experience of seeing is learned through expressions of our language, and there is no other way of learning the experience. The expressions are learned in language games, and this involves us being reasons responsive. In other words, our concepts, reason concepts, and language games carve the world and our experiences. It seems that Wittgenstein is inviting us to take seriously the idea that we see when we see seeing and thinking are presented together. And there is no theoretical or inferential process in which we first see the physical features of an image, then create an hypothesis or conjecture or interpretation of what the image might be and subsequently infer what the image represents. We see at once the rabbit and think about it. Then the change of perspective occurs and we see the duck and think about it. Why is the exercise for seeing this gestalt figure so puzzling? Because we are engaging at the same time with two thoughts and two sides, but one single organization and physical sign. We are engaging with an animal, we are certain it's called a rabbit, which jumps in meadows. And at the same time, with an animal, we are certain it's called a duck, which swims in lakes. In our thoughts and experiences of the world, these are two different animals, and we know that there is no single animal called the duck rabbit. But the drawing tells us something different. Arguably, this picture or this view on pictures is applicable to actions. When we see all this acting, we do not observe their movements as merely physical. In the majority of cases, we immediately grasp what they are doing. This means that in opposition to what is advocated by the symmetrical view, we do not rationalize or interpret the action from the third person perspective by attributing belief desires to the action in order to make it intelligible. What actually happens is that the intelligibility of the action, <coughs> sorry, strikers are seen as, and therefore no attribution of beliefs desires is necessary. For example, in the context of the classroom, we see that the students are taking notes and learning. At the bus stop, when people are standing, we see that they are waiting for the bus. At the store, we see people picking up fruit and we know that they are what they are about to buy them. Bodily movements in action are seen uh, as meaningful, like the duck rabbit, However, we, know not, we, know not, we not only see the organization and physical properties of the agent's body, the aspect of the action dawns on us. So what are the implications for legal responsibility and moral responsibility of this view? We have said that we learn words like rabbit and duck through what they do and in the context in which we refer them. For example, when as children we visit parks and meadows and our parents explain us what rabbits and ducks are and do. We also learn to be reasons responsive to these animals. For example, we feed ducks with seeds and hop about in meadows in the hope of catching rabbit. If we have a domestic rabbit, we look after it and feed it with carrot tops. And, these, and all these seems obvious and simple as we are referring to ducks and rabbits. However, how might all of these apply to inadvertent actions? Let us recall that our puzzle is about how past actions for inadvertent acts which are result or outcomes of our actions and strike as events. They constitute the subject matter of our assessments of responsibility and negligence and are correctly grasped when actions really produce within the forward-looking perspective. 
it is usually asserted that we are responsible for inadvertent actions because we ought to have this done this or that, or rather we ought to have done this or that, and we fail to do so. However, on the other hand, the way we engage with action is forward looking, and when we occupy this perspective, we act according to reasons. It seems that it is impossible to integrate the forward looking perspective of action with the backward looking view of past events when we are dealing with inadvertent actions. When someone acted inadvertently because she overlooked something or ought to have known something that she did not know when she acted, then we are not considering the reasons that are in her acting and we are disregarding her first person perspective. On the contrary, when we assess her action, we are considering her action as she ought to have acted. It seems that it is conceptually impossible to integrate both perspectives. Let us think again about the duck rabbit picture and the way we engage with the picture. We see rabbits and ducks and think identify with the picture in terms of what it represents. We can see rabbits and ducks because we have learned what rabbits and ducks do and how they relate to other animals and objects in the world. We can see the duck and think about ducks if we are not aspect blind. We can see the rabbit and have thoughts about rabbits and this aspect dawns on us. But actions are different and much more complex. What, we, what would we need to say to the child if we wanted to teach them about inadvertent actions? We do not need inadvertent actions, but they are understood if we understand what, sorry, we do not intend inadvertent actions, but they are understood if we understand what it is to act neither intentionally nor involuntarily. The question then can be formulated as, what would we need to say to a child to teach them about intentional actions? You can think about some paradigmatic examples that contain deliberation and practical knowledge and therefore intentional action. For instance, in teaching a child how to bake a cake, we teach them that we first need to mix the sugar and the butter, then add milk, eggs and vanilla, and finally flour. Put the mixture into a cake tin and put the thing into a heated oven. If by mistake we forget to add the eggs, we can then say to the child that this is what it is to act inadvertently. Namely, you knew you ought to do eggs, but you forgot to do it or disregarded it because you were distracted by doing or imagining something else. You intended to produce a state of affairs, namely a cake, and by mistake, you have produced something else, namely an indigestible mix of the sugar, butter, flour, and vanilla. The child has now learned a primitive concept of inadvertent actions. As competent adults, we develop a master in understanding what inadvertent actions are. We engage with the world from the deliberative or first person point of view. We act intentionally as we perceive ends with good making characteristics and values, but also learn that on occasion we fail because we produce by mistake the wrong state of affairs and fail to know what we ought to do or to know. Let us now try to understand how Wittgenstein's idea of seen aspects might shed light on the puzzle of the backward looking perspective for responsibility for inadvertent actions. We will only focus on the interpersonal understanding of our past actions and attributions of responsibility, but this also has ramifications for attributions of responsibility at the interpersonal level. However, this will not be the subject of this paper. Let us look closely at the variation of an example provided by Shea in his book, Who Knew? The example is called Hot Dog. Uh, in Hot Dog, Alexandra is collecting her children from a hockey game. It is a hot day and she has um, her dog in the car. She goes quickly to collect the children and leaves the dog in the vehicle. When Alexandra arrives at the pitch, a dispute between the children arises and she tries to calm them down. Consequently, due to the heated dispute, she forgets about her dog and when she returns to the vehicle, they discover the dead body of their beloved dog. The question that arises is how Alexandra is able to attribute responsibility to herself, when from the first person perspective, she only engaged in the action of collecting her children and was trying to solve the dispute that had arisen between them. She knew why she was doing, and she was doing at the moment of doing it. She knew why she parked her vehicle, left the dog in the car, and started to walk to the hockey pitch and try to solve the dispute among the children. She knew why she returned to the car. She produced what she aimed to produce. However, she did not aim to produce the death of her beloved dog. In seeing her past actions, she observed the state of affairs, namely a dead dog, and the lack of precaution of practical knowledge that she ought to have had. But how can she infer what she ought to have thought 
ought to have done or ought to have known, which produced the state of affairs, namely the dead dog. I will argue that Alessandro is able to see both a forward-looking perspective of her action, the deliberative the intention, and intentional action, and backward-looking perspective of her action, her lack of precaution and practical knowledge that produced the death of the dog, in the same way that we can see both animals in the image, like seeing the dark rabbit aspect, Alessandro can see the aspects of her own past, her lack of precaution and practical knowledge in what she produced. The dead dog, and at the same time, she can see her forward-looking action as another aspect of her actions. The backward-looking action is imposed on her and the aspect dawns upon her. She neither sees her past actions as a piece of materiality, nor as a fact or something physical. Neither does she infer from the facts, namely a dead dog, a conjecture and a hypothesis. Namely, this is my dog that I left in the car and consequently my wrong mental state, the failure of precaution and practical knowledge, caused the death of my beloved dog. The primary understanding of her action as applying the adverb inadvertently is that something has been missed in her practical knowledge and the carrying out of her action. Like in the example of the mother making a cake with her child where we miss an ingredient, the steps that led to Alessandra's action were faulty and produced the wrong state of affairs, the death of her beloved dog. In normal circumstances, and due to the normal capacities of human beings, she recognizes herself and her actions in both perspectives and can grasp both the backward looking and the forward perspective of the action as aspects, aspects of her own performance. She does not identify with her mental states nor with her bodily movement. She transcends the materiality and theoretical styles of her mind and grasps directly all the aspects of her actions. Her actions dawn on her, and this is the primary meaning of her actions. All further interpretations and reenactments of her actions, for example, in a courtroom of whether she is responsible or not, we need to rely on this primary meaning of her action. So conclusion, I have tried to show that the desideratum for an extra adequate explanation of negligent acts and the respective grounding of responsibility for negligence is that it mirrors our linguistic practice and the phenomenology of our acting while we're acting. This means that we need to explain inadvertent action from the deliberative point of view. The current paper began by reflecting on inadvertent acts from the first person perspective which is forward-looking, as opposed to seeing the result or outcome of our actions, which is essentially backward-looking. This is, however, a puzzle that arises when we try to grasp the action in the past and at the same time from the first-person perspective. Philosophically speaking, we need something that seems impossible conceptually. We need a sound backward-looking perspective for the purpose of legal and moral responsibility and negligence, which is at the same time grasp the forward-looking perspective. The puzzle is overlooked by most authors who write on responsibility and negligence because they assume the, sym asym the symmetrical thesis on both intentional and inadvertent actions. Legal theories and philosophies conflate both the first and third person perspectives and the forward and backward looking perspective of action. I have argued that the symmetrical thesis causes tension and can even commit violence to the way we think and express our mistakes and the disastrous outcome that result from inadvertent actions. Consequently, we need to rethink the methodology of grasping inadvertent action while we are acting. And finally, I suggest that the methodology offered by Wittgenstein in philosophical investigations concerning seeing an aspect of an image illuminates the way the two perspectives of inadvertent action could be made intelligible. This method of inquiry shows that there is no conceptual impossibility in grasping an action from the first person and forward looking perspective and from the backward perspective forward perspective also past the ban, which is the subject matter of responsibility. In my view, this is a fertile soil for rethinking our notions of learned capacity, values, practical reason, and character in the context of inadvertent actions. But this is a mammoth enterprise that I will enlarge upon on future occasions. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Veronica, for the wonderful talk. And I will try to um, say a few things, but uh, it will be very challenging for me because I've never uh, engaged with any proper debate about negligence or inadvertent actions. So I, I, 
I take this as a as a major as a mammoth task, <laughs> a major assignment for me, even though some of the things that I might say will sound uh, may may sound uh, trivial for you. But uh, so I will concentrate just on on the image of the of, of the duck rabbit, uh, which is fine. I think that. Uh, you, you have a, a very important puzzle and something very challenging uh, there. Um, but I think that if we want to, to claim that someone is responsible for an action, we must have a way to characterize uh, one of the possible interpretations of the image as right and the other one as wrong. We all have dispositions that allow us to see either a duck or a rabbit when we look at the image. We, we, we have the, the, the intellectual skills that allow us to understand uh, the image as either of them, because these, is, these things are available for us. So my question is, uh, how do we uh, discriminate between uh, uh, the two ways that we are looking at the same action? I think that uh, we need uh, I think that uh, this is probably this is going to be a bit different from what you said because I think that we should try to to bring back the symmetry and collapse the two perspectives and the first and the third person and the forward looking and the backward looking and what I suggest would be to try a first person plural perspective in the sense that uh, we all uh, get the meaning of our actions given some commitments uh, that are shared in a social practice. And, and these commitments, they, they, um, they establish what it is an appropriate and an inappropriate response to a given fact or a given reason or an appropriate or inappropriate attitude towards uh, a given problem or, or towards something that we do. Uh, for instance, uh, so if I am a driver, in order to be a driver, I'm, uh, uh, my, my uh, action of driving my car will be relevant only because of its social consequences, because it is, uh, it is something that I do that may affect others. And, but the, everyone else uh, is committed to the same law and I must uh, know this law in order to drive the car. So in a sense, when I drive the car, I uh, even if I am, if, even if, even when even when I am not fully aware, I must undertake commitments to certain norms that that discriminate uh, proper and in, in in inappropriate ways of driving my car. So in a sense, that if I know that I have a disposition to get distracted. When I listen to music, I should not listen to music while I drive. Why is that? Because I know that by when I drive, I must have an extra attention. And this is, is something that happened in, in a sense before I undertook uh, uh, the, the activity of driving. When I began to drive, uh, by, by doing that, just by doing that, just by, by initiating this, uh, this activity, I uh, accepted commitments. And if you think of, of pragmatist philosophies of language, and I'm, I'm working on, uh, on Brandon's uh, inferentialism, uh, Brandon claims that uh, to act in the space of reasons is to um, be able to act for, for a reason and to understand under, uh, and to put yourself under the authority of a norm that you, that you that you accept, that you commit when, when you employ it. When I employ a norm, I entitle you to, to, to employ that norm too, and to hold me accountable if I fail to satisfy the norm that I committed to. And if we think about millions of people doing the same and participating in the same game of giving and asking for reasons, uh, what's going to happen is that when I began to act as a driver, I inherit many commi commitments that were taken before. And these commitments would determine what are the appropriate dispositions that I would have, uh, that, that I should have, that I ought to have when I drive the car. 
I think that this might explain uh, why uh, you can blame me for not being able to see a duck when there was uh, this way of seeing and given the commitments that I previously undertook, this is the way that I should have uh, seen. I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if this is going to make sense to you because my reasoning is a bit, uh, I did not have much time to prepare a, a written or a more organized version of this argument. And there's a lot of background noise here. I don't, I don't know if you can listen to it, but there is a, but uh, when I turn to page eight, uh, you, you talk about the driver. In the context of recurrent linguistic practices, how should we understand this? Did the driver know at the point of acting that she lacked the required mental state? The latter statement makes the reasoning of the agent when she's performed the action. Um, but perhaps it should be because uh, when we uh, when we uh, uh, begin to 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 act in certain ways, we inherit. Uh, uh, some commitments that uh, that determine appropriate and inappropriate ways of acting. So, if if we look not only at the at the at the person who is uh, doing things, who is acting, and the person who um, assesses it at a later stage, but when, when we look at the social practice in which there are minimum, there are multiple agents. And they all uh, share some commitments about uh, proper ways to act. I think that it, it it seems to me at least easier to explain what is going on uh, when I say that someone failed to act uh, in a certain way. I think that this is one one of the questions that I would like to to press you to to see if there is any sense in this idea of. Uh, collapsing the two because we see uh, assessors and agents as, 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 as a we <laughs> that participate in the same first person plural practice. And I think that this is one thing. As to the, the other doubt that I have, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry because I'm not familiar with the literature, and uh, I hope that uh, it's not something that everyone else already settled, but for me, when you look at, at, at forward looking and backward looking, um, I think that uh, you should conceive all these actions and assessments and judgments and everything is nested uh, or, or it connected. Uh, all those actions are, are, they have a nested structure and they are, um, there's a continuous and you can move back and forth to try to understand what, uh, uh, what is the meaning of this action? And the example that I would like to give is the person, I think that you, you explored this example, but I would like to, to, to do it again. Is the person who can uh, realize that she acted uh, uh, improperly. You can explain to someone that she acted uh, inadvertently and she can, she can give, she can concede and say, yes, I now realize that I should not listen to loud music when I drive because this is part of the commitments that I undertake when I drive. I, I undertake uh, the implicit uh, commitment of being extra careful and taking a special time, a special type of, of uh, of attitude in order to, to be able to, uh, to avoid these risks that my uh, conduct creates. So I wonder if this, this could be a, an exit to the dilemma and if, if, I wonder if any of what I said makes sense. I think, I think it's time for me to shut up and <laughs> see what others have to say. Thank you very much for your attention. And it was a real pleasure uh, having you here and engaging with your fascinating work. Thank you. I think you're muted. You're muted, Veronica. So do you want me to answer the, the interesting comment now or do you want me 
to do the Q&A. Um, so my, maybe I, I would like to say something about what you have said. You, you can, you can. I think it's, if you, I can you will forget if you don't do it now. So yeah, thank you, yeah. yeah, thank you so much. This is really helpful and it helps me quite a lot. So let me, let me um, ex um, explain what you're trying to, um, the alternative view and what is your challenge. So you, you're thinking that the symmetrical view is correct because I have overlooked, I mean, in, in, the, in the paper, I concentrate on mental events, something that is interior to the agent, that we are trying to identify the condition, the absence of a mental state. But you're thinking, what about an alternative? What about if we are sharing you know, the possibility, the intelligibility of actions, because we have a commitment to norms and these norms have a social character. And these commitments, from these commitments, we can infer what we are doing. So you know that what I'm actually giving a lecture now, because we engage in certain commitments and norms of how we talk, how we do, and why we are doing certain activities. So the same applies to cases of responsibility, you're thinking. When we attribute to others, we say, oh, he is engaged in the commitment of the norm of the standard of what is to drive correctly. When this person breached that standard, that's when we achieve responsibility. Am I right on this, um, on yeah, this yeah. picture? I think my, my, my point is, is, is something like this. Uh, even though, uh, coming back to the image, we, we can see both, both things, uh, but there's one way that uh, is, is appropriate. So we should assess, uh, uh, assess uh, in light of, 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 of those implicit assumptions that if you should, uh, for, uh, because there is a point in your paper when you said that you look at the image and you can see uh, without, many, without making any further inferences that it is a, a, a duck. But then at a later stage, and another point, you, you are more deliberative and, 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 and you have more, uh, you look at another aspect, somebody points to you that it is possible to see it also as a, uh, as a rabbit. And then you're able to, to realize that, the, that you can see that too. I think that when we, talk, when, when we uh, undertake uh, take activities inside social practices, what can happen is, is that we, we may have different uh, dispositions, different uh, abilities, different ways to interact with things, but uh, we must uh, cherish some of them. We, uh, uh, we, we must uh, act according to some of, the, of these because some norms make it uh, uh, compulsory that we do it and if we, if we... yes I, I want to resist that move and and I understand where you're coming from but I want to really understand the the, the real structure of how we generate action so if the, the way I see it and that's why I present a duck um, uh, rabbit example is mm -hmm. that there is no process of inference or interpretation of our actions because the agent is the one who did all the reasoning. So when she looks back, she immediately sees the defectiveness of her exercise of practical reasoning. There was a reasoning. And that is overlooked when you are immediately assume that the standard is external to the agent, when you assume that there is conventions. Of course, I agree that we learned many of our concepts socially. But we also expand on this concept. There's a richness, there's a depth on our thinking. And I'm just trying to figure out if there is this depth, right? How we are going to grasp when we don't, uh, actions which we do don't choose. And this is the key. We don't, there is no will here. There's no commitment here. And this is one feature of inadvertent actions and what is called pure negligence. It is quite puzzling because the question is, if we construct responsibility in terms of control, in terms of choosing, in terms of will, so this is all the different theories of responsibility, including in terms of capacity. If we 
assume that, then we see that there is no responsibility for inadvertent actions. So how we are going to construct, so what I'm trying to show with this methodology, and it's a very modest paper in that sense, it's very modest because it tries to show that what we are exercising is practical reasoning and that the realizations of our actions from the first person perspective, something dawns on us because we have previously exercised the whole practical reasoning. And that, and I, I didn't develop here, but I'm developing the book, the ways the law make us aware of these kind of external reasons, of these normative reasons where we ought to pay attention. But it doesn't do it in the way of an intention, something we choose. It, it does it in the way of awareness, of dawning of reasons. And I, I will explain that later. Maybe it's too complicated for now, but this is the idea. But I understand your intuition that you think, oh, responsibility works because there is a commitment. Once you engage, but this is too fast, that's my point. It's too fast because it's not really explaining why some agents present excuses and justifications, why some agents are trying to make them, themselves intelligent to the blamer, to the accuser, to the court. And this is exactly what the symmetrical view doesn't grasp. Does it make sense? It does, yeah. And, and, and I accept the concepts are important, of course, the concepts. Are, but I think that, I mean, one, one I, I reject, for example, Malcolm's interpretation on, on, on the criteria of concepts, when we share concepts, criteria determine the meaning of concepts. And I think because there is something very interesting that um, Wittgenstein is trying to tell us, and is actually that the private, private public phenomenon is very complex. This is exactly what the point is about. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not that they are purely internal events. There's no reference, but there is a richness and complexity in internal external perspectives mm -hmm. of ourselves. And this is very well captured in inadvertent action. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you, Veronica. I think we, we already got uh, many people uh, with their hands up. So the first one is Matches. Wonderful to have you here, Matches. Uh, I think. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. Okay, because uh, the, the sound became a bit weird um, in the, the last few uh, um, seconds. Anyway, it's just um, clarificatory questions. Uh, the first one is that, you know, this whole framework that you work with, uh, does it account for the difference between the two forms of, uh, of, of negligence that, that we can encounter? One of them is negligence proper when you overlooked something. There, there was a factor that you should have the, that you should have uh, accounted for. There was a, a particular source of danger that you should have uh, uh, countered with a precautionary measure. And the other is when you 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 see the danger, but you uh, underestimate it. That's what the Roman lawyers uh, called luxuria. Uh, the, I wonder whether that makes a difference. And and the other is that. Um, uh, how, how do you make sense of uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, liability for negligence uh, in terms of a reasonable mass standard? So effectively, you're conducting a thought experiment. So imagine the same situation you put in a, a reasonable man of ordinary intelligence and experience. What, and then you ask yourself what the reasonable man would have done and you compare it to what the, what the defender uh, did. And if you see a deviation, then you uh, uh, claim negligence in, on those terms. So and I, I wonder how that, uh, how that uh, features in your account. Yeah, Marcia, thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. So, um, uh, well, in English law and uh, as well in uh, American law, there's a distinction between recklessness and negligence. So in recklessness, you were aware of the substantive risk you exposed uh, your victim. And that's not, I'm not considering that. I'm only considering the case of pure negligence, exactly. And your second question, this is really, really helpful because this is exactly what I'm trying to understand philosophically. Um, 
So let me give you a little bit of the story. So, so most of the theorists are skeptical on negligence, and I think the philosophers, and that has given quite a lot of, um, of the upper hand, I think, to utilitarianism and consequentialism. So the idea that we don't need um, the conception of duty of care and the conceptions of negligence, and that we should uh, um, replace that for other systems where you know, consequentialist views and utilitarian views are the predominant. And why I'm saying that the negligent, the skeptical view on negligence is the predominant today is because people are trying to think about responsibility in terms of, well, what some philosophers have talked about as accountability, as something that is that there was a moment of choice. So the, the, the most typical strategy to attribute responsibility in negligence is philosophically is to think about what is called the tracing strategy. So uh, the driver who is drunk, we need to think about what was the moment in which he knew or she knew that the third or fourth glass of wine will cause an impairment or drunkenness and then make it dangerous for her to drive. So you trace the time where she really made the decision, where there was an intentional action, right? So this is usually a kind of, a, a, People think then negligence doesn't exist, inadvertent action that doesn't exist. Is all there is an origin. If there is responsibility, there is an origin in a choice in a decision. There are other kinds as well as the skepticism, arguing that there is no distinction between recklessness and negligence, and negligence collapses into recklessness. The other accounts, for example, the, the idea that we have capacities, the other accounts on terms of characters rational functioning, um, when, when we rationally function well, we say we are responsible. So on, on all these accounts, they're trying to really excavate on the grounds of responsibility, philosophically speaking. And then by contrast, we have the notion of the duty of care in law, and we have the conception of reasonable standard. And these are two different conversations. And few people, obviously ones I have been first and Alexander, they have you know, navigated through both, through the philosophical terrain and through the doctrinal terrain. But I think that if we think, if we're going to really rescue the doctrinal aspect and the concept of reasonable standard, it, I, we need to first understand how the action works, how inadvertent action is possible, and what does it mean that we can, are able, not only we ought to, but we are able, as the kinds of creatures we are, to fulfill the reasonable standard. And how does it work? And it's exactly the work I'm engaged with. So in this paper, I'm just trying to say, there's no moment of choice, because the way we learn things, we learn them, giving them intelligibility, transcending facts, mental states, inferences, theoretical aspects, interpretations and we just things become intelligible to us and i'm not going to say much about it but the reasonable standard is way with learning to do the things that we ought to do and the law is nothing but an invitation to do the things in that way so one question is how we become and we become in certain ways through blame, through the way the law operates. That's the argument. That's the bottom of the argument. So you're right, your intuition about reasonable standard is the research, is the question I'm arguing about practical reason. How practical reason works in an excellent way and in an efficient way. That's the question. And the, how they mirror each other. Does it make sense? Good. Uh, okay, so we got now uh, uh, Daniel Murata. Daniel, uh, it's your turn. Uh, I think that Ken actually raised his hand before me. I just put the icon. I think he has it first. Can I, I, I do you? not see his hand. That's why I, <laughs> I, I did not call him. Uh, if okay. Ken wants to go, it would be a pleasure. Ken. Your turn. I'm happy for Daniel to go since you already called on him. Uh, okay. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. So I'll go then. Uh, Let so, me just clarify the question. Uh, yeah. Did Ken want to ask something or not? I'll go after Daniel. Ken. I'll go after Daniel. Yeah, he's happy okay, to talk wonderful. to Daniel. 
Ah, okay. Okay, right. Okay. okay. Thanks, Ken. So, okay, right. Uh, thanks, Veronica. I really enjoyed the paper, and uh, actually, I'm quite sympathetic to the to the to the main argument. So, what I have here, there are actually two questions slash commentaries that I, I would want to listen a bit more. So, the first thing, one thing that always bothered me is why so many smart people made this conflation between the two models, the symmetrical and the asymmetrical model. That was one thing that was bothering me. Why so many smart people went for that? And I, for one, I think that the conflation of the, of the two models is actually misguided. And one thing that uh, uh, kind of seems natural to me is that the conflation was actually, if you, if you think about the genealogy of those ideas, the conflation is actually necessary if we want blame to actually play the role you usually attribute to blame. So the thing is, by the moment I start to conflate, uh, to, to use your, to, to get what you're arguing, by the moment I start to conflate the first person or the liberative perspective with the third person and the forward looking perspective to backward looking perspective, this makes this, the, the, the job for blame much easier because I can just say, well, you ought to know better. You shouldn't do that, you ought to know better. So it makes easier for blame. So I wonder if this is the kind of thing that might be interesting in addressing why those people actually went for this misguided route. And I think that the reason why they went for that is that because that makes the job easier, it makes, it makes easier to justify the paralysis of blame. It doesn't mean that this is actually correct because I don't think it's correct, but it, it actually explains the allure of this idea. So that's the first point. Should I go for the second straightforwardly? Yeah, and so can we discuss this? This is very interesting. So you think, so I think because blame is naturally theoretical, that's what you're thinking. So of course, if you assume the symmetrical view, you don't have to deal with practical reason, right? You immediately go for the theoretical account. What are the conditions of responsibility? Yeah. And then you, you, design, you define the conditions of responsibility that X, Y, Z. Whereas if you think first, how we act, which is a, a prior question responsibility, and you just don't think much about control by explaining how action works, you might end up with things that are not exactly like control, right? Which is a very mechanical, so on and so on. But you might end up with something completely different. Then how you go from there to blame? That's the question, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. That's the first and I hope to, to address it. Yeah, I hope to address it. And that's that's the last chapter, exactly that. Mm -hmm. yeah, because this is something that uh, uh, really strikes me as really interesting, why people are so concerned about the justification of blame and how people go on on that. But, and the second point is, I wonder if it might be a useful advantage of the counter proposing that it can actually make sense of agency in practice of responsibility. And the example I have here, the example that actually- Sorry, often... sorry, Danny, can you repeat? Ah, yes, of course. So I was wondering, I think that one big advantage of the model is that it actually helps to make sense of agency in the following sense. Uh, one example that was popping to my mind all the time when, while I was reading the paper in between like the five Zoom meetings today, uh, one example that was popping to my mind was the case of Oedipus and Oedipus Tyrannus, and then later Oedipus and Oedipus at Colonus. If you, because this seems to me exactly what you are talking about. If you look at what Oedipus does in Oedipus Tyrannus, he's not, all his actions, all this, the narrative of Oedipus life is actually, uh, he never intended to kill his father, to marry his mother or anything like that. He, he, what he intended, he intended to kill someone that offended him, he intended to marry the queen that he won in, in a tournament, and so on and so forth. Up to a point that it, uh, uh, the, I think that's Theresias, I can't remember who was the prophet in the play anymore. Up to a point that someone points out, hey, look, actually, you are the one that is to, to be blamed for everything going on in Thebes because you, you actually murdered your father and married your mother. And then it kind of he kind of snaps. So that's what I find interesting about the idea of dawning of action. That's when it actually had this moment of dawning. And yeah. it was realizes that he was unaware he, that there was lacking this piece of knowledge that would enable him to avoid the tragedy that happened. So he looks like, he seems like a really good example of what you are talking here 
about having two perspectives, like that's a sort of the rabbits of responsibility. Nothing that Oedipus did was aiming at the results that he got. But once he got there, then the, the aspect dawned to him and then he could see what actually happened. And then he had the, the, the line in the play about, he goes on saying, what have I done and this kind of stuff. And the thing is, when you move the, to the to other play to Oedipus at Colonus, then what you have there is an interesting thing because Oedipus claims in the beginning of the play that he didn't act, he, he actually suffered the things more than he did then. And this seems like a, a quite strange move in his, in, in, in his view in the two plays, but it's interesting because it seems to me that this illustrates the side effect of having the conflated view. Because if you have the conflated view, at the end of the day, you might be throwing agents out of the window. Uh, and can you repeat this? Exactly I, what is the conflicting view? Explain no, no, no. Uh, not conf uh, 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 I think that the view that Oedipus ends up presenting on Oedipus at Colonus is an example of the conflating view that crashes the first oh, yeah. perspective. Yeah. yeah. Okay. When, and when he does that, at the end of the day, he can say, hey, look, actually, those were the gods. I actually suffered those things more than I did then. And the thing is, because he has the conflated view, at the end of the day, the side effect of that is that we can drop agency out of the picture. And the paradox of doing that is that by the moment you drop agency out of the picture, you are dropping responsibility as well. So the side effect of having the conflated picture is that it seems easier to justify blame, but mm -hmm. at the same time, it makes much harder for you to bring agency into the account and without agency, you lose responsibility mm -hmm. and then blame collapses again. So, correctly, uh, correctly. Yeah, so you capture the spirit. So you need to really grasp what the agent, how he sees and what the agent is. In the case of Oedipus, of course, he was ignorant of his circumstances. So in, in, in terms of the conflation view, he will be justifiable. But in terms of, of the, the, the story of his agency, that's the tragedy. That's exactly where the tragedy is, right? The yeah. point of the tragedy, it was his ignorance and there was nothing he could have done, right? Yeah. So that's the case that the tragedy becomes because there's nothing he could have done. But let us move to not that agency, but an agency where you could have done. So the question here, what is the role of blame? And if the role of any of blame and judgments of responsibility is that the enters the reasons enter into our practical reasoning, then we need to understand how practical reasoning works and how judgments of responsibility are able to. But in the case of Oedipus, the credit comes because there's no way blame will do the work because yeah. there were ignorance of his circumstances. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's the, that captures very well. It's it's extreme case, but it's still a tragedy precisely because we understand it from the point of view of practical reason of Oedipus, mm -hmm. not the conflation view. Yeah, mm -hmm. makes sense. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. So Ken, now it's your turn. Yeah. Hi, Veronica. This is I I, I don't know. Hi. Hey, um, <laughs> I don't know if this is really meant as a, 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 um, a criticism or a clarification because I'm not sure I'm on the right side here, but um, there's two things that I'm worried about. Uh, one starts at, and they, they link together in order to explain what I'm thinking. Um, one starts at the end of the paper, right before the conclusion where you say that all further interpretations and reenactments of her actions, that is of the, in this case, the woman who left the dog, are, um, what, for example, in a courtroom of whether she's responsible or not, will need to rely on this primary meaning of her action. And the primary meaning is, um, in the previous sentence, the primary meaning is um, she does not identify with her mental states nor with her bodily movements. She transcends the materiality and theoretical stance of her own mind and grasps directly all the aspects of her action. So um, this suggests to me um, that you're thinking that the, that the agent is somehow integrating um, the different perspectives that are suggested 
by the duck rabbit example. Yeah. Now, I might be completely wrong with my understanding of what Wittgenstein was doing with the duck rabbit example, but I can say this about the phenomenology. The phenomenology that, I, I don't, and correct me if you have a different experience than me, when I, ex, when I look at the duck rabbit, the one thing I cannot do is integrate it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, Wittgenstein's point. You flip back and forth between seeing the duck and seeing the rabbit. You can't see both the duck and the rabbit at the same time. You can only see either the duck or the rabbit. Now, from a theoretical standpoint, we can step back and realize that and then think to ourselves, well, that's very interesting. There's both a duck and a rabbit there, although we can't see both at the same time. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we, we form a sort of integration when we think about it, maybe, but we can't make the integration into a phenomenology, phenomenological experience. Like we can't experience the integration. We can only reflect on the fact of it. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. So the dark rabbit has, there are two issues on the dark rabbit. I haven't gotten to the punchline yet, but oh, okay, go oh, ahead. Oh yeah, so let me, let me, because this is a very interesting point. So the dark rabbit, it, it, it becomes puzzling because our experience has ducks on one side and rabbits on the other. Yeah. So it is, it is strange that we see a creature, we don't know any creature that is duck rabbit. That is exactly the puzzle. You're exactly right. right. So we have, a, and how we know about ducks? Oh, with the duck rabbit, we don't apprehend the figure in terms of the lines, but in terms of our experiences and concepts of ducks. Right. So we play with ducks when we were children, we, we swim, we, we, we describe them, we draw them, and the same with the rabbit. So we have experiences yeah. with rabbit, we had rabbits at home at some point when we were children and so on. You're absolutely right. So the, the, the dawn, there is a dawning point, right? There's a dawning There's a, where you realize the experience of the duck comes to your mind, where you're only focusing on the rabbit. Or when you're only focusing on focusing on the duck, the experience of the rabbit dawns on you, and that so, is what I wanted to highlight. No, so it's yeah. not really an integration. I thank you for mentioning because it's a dawning. Is the dawning, yeah, so the, dawning the dawning is a theoretical stepping back from the experience. Correctly, it's Re a reflecting. On I don't want to call it theoretical, Ken. I want okay. to call it is a reflective point. Exactly. You look at oh dear, what I have done. So, so I think that the reflection, the, the point of reflection of the two aspects is not an ability to integrate the two aspects. Mm -hmm. now, once, we, once we agree that we can't integrate the two aspects and what we are recognizing in our reflection on those two aspects is that we are in a sense condemned to flip back and forth between them when it comes to experience. The best that we can do is reflect on that flipping and not actually experience an integration. Then I worry, this mm -hmm. is my opinion, that possibly for practical reasons, that what we're saying is gonna happen in the courtroom is that the court is simply going to tell you, ignore the other aspect. You can't integrate them. So we can't have a perspective from which we can make legally relevant judgments that integrates the two aspects. So in any given set of, uh, any, any circumstance that calls this to mind, such as an inadvertent act, we're gonna give you criteria. And after you look at those criteria, you're going to make a decision that privileges one of the two aspects and ignores the other. And the justification for that is partially pragmatic, we have to privilege one or the other in making a legal judgment because we either say, we, we look at the person as responsible for actions, as the author of her actions, et cetera, et cetera. Or we flip and we see her as, you know, excusable or as, 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 as not, as the, the, the description of the action that caused the legal difficulty as not being one under which she is, is, is an agent because she was, because of the inadvertence. And we, we give you criteria for deciding which of the two aspects you're going to privilege, but you have to privilege one, and I can point to, and I'm gonna to point to Wittgenstein to tell you why you have to privilege one, which is that you can't integrate them. 
And since you can't integrate them, we can only use one at a time. And since we only use one at a time, we have to choose for practical reasons and for other reasons, which one of the two aspects we're going to choose when we make our legal judgments. Yeah, good, good. So why do you think we, should, we wouldn't uh, um, be able to only take the point of view of practical reasoning without the, why do you think we need necessarily to take, to, if we privilege practical reasoning and we invite the, the, the judgments to be made in terms as well of practical reasoning and we create a method to engage with practical reasoning of others, which is something I'm not doing in this paper. Why do you think it's not possible? Why in terms of criteria? So I'm, I'm assuming mm -hmm. that there are going to be pragmatic reasons for a legal, for a legal system in a, in a, you know, who, that, that has a system of tort law to have some space for looking at actions of making a division between actions it's going to determine are um, excusably negligent, like negligent, but not excusable, um, you know, um, not responsible at all, and then fully responsible in a practical reason sense, right? So we're going to have divisions that we're going to need to make in our legal system. And we're going to know that we can know that when you're in the midst of an action, when you're looking at an action, and you're from the first person perspective, retroactively, you're gonna flip back and forth in this duck, duck rabbit kind of way between thinking of the action as you being the author and you being, as it were, a subject, right? That you didn't intend it, you didn't mean it. And we'll recognize that. But the legal system can't do anything with that flipping. It just has a, a set of criteria for determining whether we're going to privilege this aspect of it or that aspect of it. And sometimes we'll privilege one and sometimes we'll privilege another. Sometimes, right, so sometimes we'll, we'll look at the criteria and we'll say, okay, well, these are the actions. We're gonna privilege the point of view, the aspect that says, no, I am the author of my actions, hold me responsible. And then other times we're gonna have a set of criteria that's gonna say, okay, that person's not the author of our actions. And then maybe that's a separate question whether or not we still have some responsibility that goes into that, whether that be because of negligence um, without an excuse or whether we're just going to completely excuse the action, right? Okay, what about, I tell you, I'm going to answer another way of thinking okay. about it. Yeah. So what about if I tell you, remember my challenge as well is to explain the doctrinal aspects of tort law negligence. Yeah? Sure. So we have the notion of duty of care, the concept of proximity and forcibility, this is English law, and the notions of causation. Yeah. And we get into all sorts of trouble because if we have a duty of care, philosophically speaking, we ask what kind, I mean, it's not only that I ought to, but whether I can, I'm able to. So the, 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 the explanation is yes, you are able to because there are ex effective exercises of practical reason. And I'm going to tell you how it works. But then people are still, yeah, and these are the conse consequentialists and utilitarians, they're going to say, listen, you still have to pass all the problems of, of you know, results of your action that are unintended or really wh why you, would you be responsible for unintended actions? So the answer is, oh, because the key role of the law of negligence is proleptive blame and proleptic reason. It gives right. you a proleptic reason. So this is the whole task. This is the task. If you don't have that, you, practical reasoning will, will not work as it ought to be. That is right. the answer. Right, and but then, so that's my point. That's my point about the pragmatics, right? The pragmatics is that given that this is the goal of the tort law, it's it, and that you're not going to be able to integrate the two aspects of yeah. action, that it will end up inevitable that it'll have to give you, it'll have to ask you to privilege one or the other aspects when you make your judgment. Yeah, that thank you. Be able to yeah. avoid uh, a system that asks you to make that, to make a, a to privilege one aspect when making a legal judgment. That's what I'm saying. Now you may be right, and it may be different in different systems and there might be different ways to privilege it. And there might be different reasons or different goals that you could articulate for your tort law and things like that. But it's, it's merely 
it's not the kind of thing where we can theoretically step back, recognize the incompatibility of the two aspects and somehow embrace them both. It's because we're going to be in situations where you're just gonna have to choose at the end of the day to make the judgment. It's a duck or it's a rabbit, that's it. You're not gonna be able to keep them both. Uh, yeah, I, I need to think about it because there's something else I want to say about that because we're thinking about, um, but what about, I mean, I'm engaging in an action, yeah? And I'm trying to do something and something else turns up, right? And there's a defective engagement of my practical reasoning. When I look back, I'm terrified. Oh my dear, what I have got. Uh, so now I'm in a, at another level of my practical reasoning. It's like with regret or shame, right? You, you just get it that there is a no higher level position of yeah. ethical point of view where you yeah. could do better. Right. Why I'm not at that point of becoming better, of becoming, I am not actually able to make compatible both. Why? Absolutely. For you as the first person, that's fine and that's great. And that's, yeah, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. but to make a legal judgment, when we, when you come in, so let's imagine there's no questions of evidence. There's no questions of proof or anything like that. You come in and you tell the complete story, hundred percent truth. And you say, and this is my experience. My experience is that I look back at my action and I see this aspect of it that is intentional and the product of my intentional choices. And I acknowledge that and I acknowledge the results of those intentional choices. And I see this aspect of it that's beyond my, beyond was beyond any choices that I made. And it was, it was a completely inadvertent result, yeah. right? And I, I present all that to the court and the court has to make a decision. Is the person responsible or not? And for how much? And in making that decision, it will necessarily privilege one or the other of the two aspects. That's what I'm saying. I'm not- I understand, but it's still saying, duty of care will work. And now we understand why duty of care works. You ought to have known, and you ought to have been in a better position, but we have a full explanation now. That's the difference, I think. I see, so you're, you, you can use the- the Duty of care. Inability to come, you can use the inability to um, integrate the two aspects as a justification, a rationalization for the duty of care. Um, I have to think about that a little bit more. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. if, if that's what you're doing, then okay, then, then you might be right about that. But I duty of care is the model. I mean, there is a right and a duty. That's intuitively correct. Yeah. But we don't know. I mean, the, the, the utilitarianism, uh, utilitarianism and consequently have the upper hand because we still have a lot of puzzles on theory of action. Yeah. Only attending carefully in detail, explaining in detail what is really happening in advertent action, we have the power to say that's why the right, the right duty model is the correct one. This is more complicated, but I think I'm simplifying. I'm sorry about that. No, 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 that's okay. I'm trying to, I have to think more about how it integrates with the duty of care to be able to say. Yeah, that, that, I'll, yeah. I'll send you some some chapters in the book for that. <laughs> for sure, yeah. for sure. Thank you so well, much for making me think about it. And absolutely right, you're right. It has to be clear what is the role of these in in the process of judgment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think now that after Ken's comments, I think my question made made more sense to me. Going back to to my previous point of view. Uh, so what I assumed is that it is possible, impossible to integrate. So there are two ways of looking at the thing and you have norms that determine which is the right way. And sometimes when, and what I, what I wanted to say is that uh, there are some uh, role obligations or so, social, socially imposed obligations that you just by participating in the, in the practice in certain ways you commit to reading it in one way rather than the other. So it's not possible to integrate. Yeah, and that's at the point, yeah. um, Thomas, that is the point at the, of interpretation, right? Yeah. But I'm saying the primary material is the process of practical reasoning. Yeah, but I, I understand the worry. Thank you very much. I understand the worry, yeah. yeah. I think Danny also raised okay. his hand, no, Danny? 
I have had Jorge, but he, he had to oh, leave yes. uh, the yes. room because he had another uh, another meeting. So uh, I think he's back now. Jorge, uh, do you still want to make a question? Hi, Laura. Well, let's 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 uh, let's hear uh, Daniel first. Yeah. Daniel. So uh, Jorge, do you want to make the question first? Because mine is a minor Please. comment. So if you no. want to go first, uh, I was then again. I, I, the thing is. I don't see, but then again, I might just be, I just gave up justifying things in general. I don't see why is there a problem in not being able to integrate, integrate at all. The thing is, when you have that dawning of action, the, the, the example I gave of Oedipus, when he gets to that, what have I done? When he gets to that point is the point in which he can actually take responsibility for what he has done independently of everything else. So from the, the perspective of the agents, that's when blame and guilt and shame can actually stick because he now sees what he has done. Before that, it makes no sense. So uh, from the first, the, from the point of view of the agents, that's, that's as good as, uh, as good. I mean, that makes as much sense as it can make sense. Whereas when you're talking about the law, that's, and that goes back to Ken's point, uh, well, the law, has some pragmatic concerns. The law has some concerns about legitimacy and authority and trying to establish some sort of common ground in, common ground in the political community. So the law presents some standards. The law takes to be legitimate, to be the right standards, and that's it. But those will actually only be, and that, that's the point, those will actually only be reason given, will you only stick to the agent if, he, if she have recognizes those. And the agent we only recognize those if she can actually have the sort of the the, the, the flip the flip and going back back and forth with the the two perspectives. Otherwise, should otherwise the agent will be kind of uh, 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 should be blinded to the reason demands of the law. So I don't see why we need to integrate at all because for those things to actually work, both blame blame in the moral domain and legal responsibility for those things to work, you need to be able to go back and forth because, mm -hmm. not, because they are not the same thing. And yeah, that, for- mm -hmm. Thank you, Dani. So, so you think that, yeah, there is, a, there is a recognition, but there could be avoidance, isn't it? Of the fact, there could be, there is a dawning and there is avoidance. Yeah, there could be. And, and, in that, and if that is the case, then the, uh, this tells us something about the character of the agent. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Too bad for him. We have the law, and we think that the law is legitimate. They're going to jail. Too bad for you. And and then that's that's the end of talk. So that's yeah. uh, so that that's that's my point. I don't see why, uh, from the point of view of what those things are supposed to do, we don't. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think they need to think a little bit more careful about this. And so um, I think the worry of of, of Ken is um, is how it's going to really reflect. The position of the first person perspective no and the, the courts yeah that's his worry i see the point and i think maybe it's impossible i think i yeah. agree that's why the duty right is so powerful but what is happening there in the underlying structure is something else this is the point and then we can actually not give a give a strong argument against consequentialism and, and thinking, oh, the, the negligence system cannot disappear because plays this role, and this is the role, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess that in a sense, I, I think that the sort of intuition that's underlying what I'm saying is that maybe at the end of the day, uh, the law simply can't do justice to the richness of radical reason. It, it needs to stick to the, yeah. the personal point of view, maybe. But then, yeah, I don't but know, I just... It, yeah. But also we hear the stories, you see, of, uh, you know, the explanations of the mother who comes to the accident a few minutes later or a few minutes earlier and how the judges distinguish between primary and secondary victims. We are listening to the victims and to the, to the, or the, the parties, that's the whole point, yeah, to see the practical reasoning. Mm -hmm. It tries to capture it in a way, you know. I think Jorge wants to have a question as well. Thank you so much, Veronica. Can I? 
yeah, perfect. So, okay. so, 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 so thank you so much for this excellent paper. I have like three brief comments slash questions. So the first one is just a comment. I want to thank you for this paper. So from my point of view, who I try to do philosophy of tort law, this is awesome. When, when you talk about philosophy of tort law in Latin America, people say, why do you want to make something so easy, that complicated? Something like A horse B, A has to pay. And, uh, and, and, and when we try to go this, this his history of A horse B and the A has to pay, it takes us a given. There is a lot of givens there and we have to, to understand that. And we have to understand that we make a mark in the world and try to understand how we, how we clarify this. And, and I get that the main idea of your paper is that an improved understanding of action leads to an improvement of standing so, uh, of law to, to borrow roughly from Austin. So, so th that's rich and make me think a lot of things. However, I have like, these are my two points. So on the one hand, uh, the, uh, uh, and I have tried to pick out the discussion, even though I was not here, there is this a way in which the, the doc a rabbit example mirrors the structure of practical reasoning in the sense that the, these philosophers of tort law um, often say that tort law is a structure of practical reasoning that involves many stories. So the defendant, the, the, the plaintiff, defendant, individual courts, people within individual courts. And the dog rabbit seems to have an idea of a spontaneity. So every story is spontaneous comes to you. However, this is not, this doesn't uh, accord directly on how our stories happen in, at least in our institutional practices of tort law in which a defendant gives, a plaintiff brings a story uh, and saying, this is a dog and the defendant brings another story. This is a rabbit and all of that. And often those stories are mirrored by individual practices. And I think this is what Thomas point like, I, like a driver should do this or, or a, a reasonable individual should do this and, and those colors. So, so, uh, so this, this uh, sense of a spontaneity of the story might not mirror the complexity of, of the practical considerations that are dwelling in the tort realm. When you go to the first stage judgment and when you go to appeal judgment, when you have like a, like a, a plurality of judges deciding a case and they have dissents and all of that, and you're going to say, no, five see a rabbit, four see a duck. So it, it, I, I thought the reason is not as spontaneous as the metaphor seems to suggest. And my second concern is, is, is related to, to, to Matthias Vodix is how this story mirrors our doctrinal concept. So Matthias mentioned about uh, reasonableness, and I believe that's the strength. The, the biggest strength of, of the new model is reasonableness. But some people, and I have in mind some, some, something like Richard Einstein, will say something, but this is not the story. The story is about causation. We have to provide a rich story about causation in order to understand how harms are made. So I suspect that you have a different view from the standard account of causation. I suspect you entail, so this intention-centered account leads to something uh, different about causation. So I would like to hear if there is time, something about how causation will look on this perspective. Yes, absolutely, thank you. Well, this is a very, very wide and complex territory, but you're right. I'm trying to say that actually um, action is caused by thought, and our desires and the transformations of thoughts and desires is possible. And that somehow, if you need to talk about causation, we are these kinds of people who bring things to the world. And the way you see and the audience see what I'm bringing to the world now is not a fact. I'm bringing meaningful words, I bring, I'm bringing content, I'm bringing ideas. So I also, with talking and thinking, I'm bringing things to the world and not necessarily thinking in terms of pure causation. So I think that's, um, that's why I think the structure, the, 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 the link between right and duty, the pair of right and duty and the correlation right and duty and the wrong with, with, with others is the correct model for the law of negligence. Um, and then that is the framework. And then we need to scrutinize what is underneath that, what is happening there. And I, I don't know if that answered your question on causation and that's where reasonableness come. And I know there's, the idea of causation is goes back to the view that I made a choice, you see, I at some point, or that I, I ought to have done something. And this was not necessarily a choice, but something in my mental state. And then therefore I caused something in the world through that. And that is exactly the model I'm questioning. 
can I say something? This is, this is really rich. So, but, but my question is, is how it mirrors or black letter law in which we have these Absolutely. shopping list yeah. requirements for responsibility. So are you trying to reconstruct the underlying structure of black letter law or, or telling yeah. that the current, so a structure is wrong or do we have to create new black, black letter law that accords with a richer understanding of intention? Absolutely, thank you very much. It's a very good question. So I'm saying this, we have the doctrinal views, we have the notion of duty of care, forcibility, proximity, and the concept of reasonable standard. And that is the framework with which we are working. And my question is, what is there that is not only a duty, what is, what is the role of the duty of care in our practical reasoning? That is one question. And the other question is, what is the structure? It's not only that I ought to have known, I ought to have behaved in such and such a way, but whether I can. I'm doing the moral psychology of negligence. Okay, okay. And it's navigating between understanding the doctrinal worries, the lawyer, but also understanding moral psychology, theories of action and philosophy. And I see this as a continuity task. Why? Because this is an answer to the utilitarianist and to the consequentialist. That can never be replaced because if they, there is a role for practical reason and practical reason is the thing we do, then if you, have, if you, if you replace the, the, the concept of negligence, you are replacing something very fundamental for practical reasoning. That's the argument. Okay. So it's not a mirror of, of doctrinal, it's excavating underneath doctrinal work. So, so the, the, the worry is how much credence do we give to judges? In, in this sense, it's like the argument against utilitarianism is this, it's like they say, they say responsibility doesn't, it, it's, it's, a, it's a mirage. So, and, and we say, look, we have tort law, we have a, we're assigning responsibility every day. So, but how much credence do we give to what judges do? Thing. Do we take them at face value? Do we, or do we, we can say, even though ju judges are wrong about how they understand causation, intention, and responsibility, so, so that, 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 uh, even though they, they may be wrong in how they do it, we're going to take the underlying structure. So I, I, I am not clear about this relationship with, with the current practice, yeah. even though I see it. Yeah, and another, there's another element that I think is very easy to think about in, uh, about action in terms of as a factual matter yeah. as, a, as a something we cause and then there are consequences the consequence is the correct calculation it's very easy to do that and it's very pragmatic mm -hmm. but I think it's also we're missing something really really important consider duty and right and, excavate. Yeah. and I don't think that, for example, some people in his wonderful book, Wal uh, Goldberg and um, Sipursky, they advance that the, the correlation of right and duty is grounded, has a grounded on social practices. And I'm also, do, I don't agree with that exactly, because I think there is something else here that is quite interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. Uh, we still got time for one last question, uh, and it's going to be matches again. Uh, matches, so you're on now. Okay, uh, it's actually it's actually two questions. Uh, um, more, one of them is more like a comment. Uh, I try to be brief about this. One of them is the duty of care point. Uh, it was re revelatory to me that that, that that's what, what, what you're shooting at, that, uh, you know, making better sense of duty of care. And uh, I, I teach this stuff. I teach basic, basic negligence. And uh, I'm incredibly uh, confused about the concept. Uh, I, it's, it's, it's horribly constructed. Uh, there, there could be ways in which it could be, uh, could be clarified, but uh, what, what you find in the case law is, uh, I'm talking about United Kingdom, is, uh, is, is, is really, really confusing. And uh, increasingly, uh, judges use duty of care as a control mechanism, so they can shape, the, they, can, they can manipulate the scope of liability, and they're moving questions in and out of, uh, in, in and out of duty of care. So indeed, there is, there is uh, room here for, for um, uh, a philosophical investigation, which I'm not sure that that, that that could make a massive impact exactly because the way judges use the concept 
uh, has this element to it that they want to keep control over it and they 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 are they often deliberately avoiding a deeper clarification on the real point is that you know increasingly over this conversation i i i, I beginning to have doubts about the idea of an inadvertent action mm -hmm. uh, and that's what this these towers two hours were, 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 were about for me because Maybe what is inadvertent is the consequence, is not the action itself. You do your thing, you had your intentions, and then it turns out that it had some consequence that you didn't reckon with, you should have reckoned with. So then it's uh, the intentionality of your actions and the inadvertence of some consequences, the, the, the clash between the two is what, uh, what may be at the heart of our understanding of what negligence is. Well, I... I also, in one of the chapters I argue, but I don't want to give away too much, is that uh, then negligence, what happens in terms of practical reasoning is a kind of a grisia, and is a, but there's a particular understanding of what a grisia is. Namely that you um, intend to do something, you deliberate, but there is an issue of the effective process of character in which you don't bring about what you expect it to bring about. And I explain that later, yeah. So it's not necessarily that you force, you have foreseen the, you foresee the consequences or you have clarity of, of what you are doing or the, uh, because this is precisely what recklessness is when you foresee the consequences. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I just want, to, thank you very much, uh, Matthias, but I just want to put that in bracket because that it is in the inadvertence action is something when you deliberate and you engage with the activity, but you do it in an ineffective way. And we need to explain how does it work, absolutely. But the word inadvertent, I probably is, is terrible because the word inadvertent means that I didn't pay attention. And that there's something of truth on that. So I need to explain it. I need to, I need maybe for another paper, yeah the chapter. I hope you can read the book. <laughs> it's a terrible noise here. Somebody's just uh, building, a, uh, re refurbishing the apartment upstairs and they, re they decided to, to drill something now. Uh, now I'm finally, <laughs> I'm glad that I'm able to end this conversation. No, I can no longer. Sorry. Okay, let me try to move on. Thomas, I think Lucas has been trying to say something. You see, uh, some things that happened uh, during conference calls, that's fantastic. Okay, you, 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 you are... Thomas, do we have time for a question from Lucas? You're hosting a, a seminar in philosophy. Uh, I think he's moving and then the internet is... And all of a sudden somebody... Yeah, Thomas, we're fine. I and think... It starts to drill a wall in your... And you can listen to anything at all. Uh, but Thank you very much, Vienna, for your questions. I think I didn't answer Mina's question. Yeah, so... and, and Lucas was also raising his hand as well. Yeah. yeah Lucas um, had a question. Lucas, okay. and then we can go to Mina before she leaves. Yeah. Yes, Lucas. Yeah, just, just as maybe a quick question. Uh, it's, it's a follow-up question, uh, I think. So, uh, for, for, first of all, thanks for your talk, Veronique. Uh, I really enjoyed the paper. So I, I think my question is an extension of uh, Kinect comments. Because I, I was thinking, uh, so what, when I experience something uh, in, in Wittgenstein's terms, I experience like episodically, like just this way or just another. Like, I, I'm experienced the rabbit, or I'm experienced um, the duck. So this is not like um, a whole experience. So if this makes sense, if this is the way, the, the right way to int interpret uh, Wittgenstein um, aspect of seeing. So I, I, I would like to 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 think that. So we can take the the, the accident example and imagine the same situation in which there is no child child around and then there is no accident, like the same situation. So if, if, if this is possible, so don't you think that we should accept a sort of moral luck? Because 
I think it's the same situation, uh, but the child is not around, so there is no accident. But when we go to trial, this this matters. Like we should put uh, the um, inside the, the practical reasoning, the idea of moral luck, like Bernard Williams says. So don't you think this makes sense? We should accept a, a sort of moral luck in, in practical reasoning. I just it's just a question. Down. Lucas, this is a very good question, and it's exactly this view of action that I'm trying to resist. So the idea, I mean, how the way moral luck is set up is that the both sides, I mean, especially when, how Jeremy Waldron uses in his paper, uh, Masses Losses, right? Um, published in Foundations of Tort Law, um, edited by Owen. The way he set up the, the, the problem, taking the, issue, the question of moral law, which I will go back again a little bit, what is the issue of moral law here and how Williams used it. But in, the, in, in, in tort law has been used as, these two agents are exactly the same. The one who has the accident is the one who doesn't have the accident. They are exactly the same. And this is the move that I'm trying to resist. And this, there's a simplification of the example. So I cannot go on, de in de on details on, on that because it requires to, to understand how exactly the, the problem of deliberation works and how agresia works and, and explain why one is liable and the other not. Thank you. But this is a very important um, problem, yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay, uh, let me uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Chavo. I've been here listening to Veronica's presentation, and Thomas asked me to chair from now on uh, because of the noise in his in his flat. So I believe we had uh, one more uh, time for one more question. And uh, if I if I'm not wrong, I believe it's Mirna who asked to make a question, isn't it? Yes, Mirna. Uh, Okay, uh, then Mina, so you can open your, your mic and make a question, please. Hi, everyone. Hello, Mina. I think you asked the question on the chat on Japan's standard of law regarding accidental fires and arson, right? And then... Well, when Daniel was talking, he meant, uh, when everyone mentioned the Asians, I just, re I just recalled, um, my understanding is that in Japan, it, it doesn't matter whether you set a fire accidentally or intentionally, the punishment is the same. And is this... And, um, this is the type of thing. Was this the type of thing you were speaking about? Yeah, it, regardless of intention, right? Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes, that's that's, that's exactly the point. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm good. <laughs> thank okay, you so exactly. much. This thank is great. <laughs> okay, so uh, I believe it's time for us to end the, the seminar now. Uh, I would like to uh, thanks uh, Veronica for his brilliant for her brilliant presentation, and I would like to thank uh, all of you for being here and taking part in this debate in this uh, Q and A. Uh, and I hope to see you uh, soon in uh, the next edition of our international seminars in philosophy of law. Thank you very much. I'll I'll hand over the, okay. the uh, yeah. pass the word to Thomas. I just want to say also thank you for the wonderful questions. Very challenging. And that shows me I have to think this really more careful. Thank you very, very much. It, it has been a wonderful uh, session. Thank you very much, Veronica. You gave a lot for us to think about. And uh, let me be quite frank. You, you raised my interest in negligence law because I never thought I, I could find any philosophical puzzle, puzzle in it. So thank you very much for this. It has been uh, fantastic. Thank you. thank you. And so now we end. Bye bye for all you thank all. Thank you very safe. much. Bye.